Hello there. Sorry for the dead air first. This is Jim the Keys bartender coming to you from Key Largo. Wow. Uh, I would be embarrassed if I wasn't used to saying embarrassing things. But one of the last episodes, the last episodes, was where did everybody go? Because I noticed that the numbers dropped. I'd like to say the word precipitously, but I guess it wasn't precipitous because it wasn't followed by staying low. So it was busy. It was busy this weekend. We are in height. Oh, well, we don't know if it's an eye, but we are as busy as I've seen it during spring break. I thought with the weather getting nicer and things opening up, people were experiencing their local environs, but they even, they're still coming down here. There are tons of people down here. And we'll talk to that, talk about that later and push to the breaking point. But no, we've had uh, an uptick in listenership. This is great. I do appreciate it. Uh, I still get people that come back. It's funny. There's people that have been down here the whole time during the lockdown. They're, they never left, but I haven't seen them for a while. And last night we had a group of them come in. Some guys I know. One one guy's a mailman. The other's a contractor. And used to come in late at night, hang out, have a couple drinks, eat something right before we close. And they stopped by yesterday. I haven't seen them in over a year. These uh, two fellows, they came in with a group of six. So we're talking, and the first thing out of his mouth, hey, you still doing the uh, podcast? I really like the podcast. And I said, oh, okay, great. You know, But knowing in the full well, if you really love the podcast, you'd know if it was still there because it's available. And there's, I told him, I said, there's over 120 new episodes, 150 episodes, and I'm not... But I took it with a grain of salt. And I said, oh, well, it's nice that you say that. You pay whatever compliments to it. And and it happens a lot. You're still doing the and, and if people aren't that adept at knowing the new technologies, knowing the difference between a podcast and a radio show and a blog or an online you know, social media post, and people don't know what it is, but they think they know what it is. And they talk about it. They go, oh, you do that? And I still don't know what that is. And I say, well, that's all right. You know, I guess that's the same thing with people with beepers. They didn't know years ago. People said, what the hell is a beeper? What does it do? Is it an alarm clock? Is your alarm clock's going off when you hear the beep, 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 beep. And people didn't really understand. That just means that uh, for the unschooled, I guess, I, do I have anybody that's under 30 or 40? I'm gonna, let me tell you what a beeper is. A beeper was a little thing that people would carry. And what it would tell you is if someone called your number, and this was pre-cell phone days. So it was a service that would send out a signal to this device to tell you when you received the phone call. And it would tell you the, the phone call, the, the number, the phone number of the person that called. And later on, I, I think they could send messages and things like that, possibly. And this was right. Cell phones were out. Cell phones were expensive. And beeper service was about the same as a cell phone service. That's just to let people know that they called you and then you'd have to run to a pay phone so when a beeper go off see someone call you see a number and and a lot of people used to say well you, you know when you see a beeper you think drug dealer or stockbroker doctor the famous scene from Caddyshack where the uh, doctor gets a text and he would he 
I won't even go. If you watch, if you don't know Caddyshack, you don't know Caddyshack. But I think he was wet at the time, and he grabs his beeper, and it was an old-style beeper, and he used to have, I guess they used to have shaky electronics in because the guy gets shocked. (coughs) So I relate the beeper thing in the beginning when people didn't know what a beeper was, and now people don't know what a beeper is because of, they don't, no longer exists. People don't say, the people say, oh, wow, it's kind of amazing. I'm going to pause this for a second. I think the wife's coming home, and I always hate getting interrupt, interrupted when that happens. <coughs> Plus, I feel a coughing fit coming on. Be right back. Thank you. Okay, we're back. Wow, I felt like I was choking. Let me take this off. I'm sorry about the music going on. Yes, we're back. So... We've all seen these. There's people that aren't familiar with new technology. And why would you have to get acquainted with old technology? But kids that are up to date on current technology, try to explain them Morse code, how the telegraph worked. I imagine it's like explaining to a white person what a spoke signal I mean, smoke signal kind of makes sense. You could send like a black smoke, gray smoke, silver smoke, and you could cover it up, send several puffs up at a time. That say, well, three puffs of smoke mean there's a, a group of settlers coming by. There's a whole bunch of di- different ways you can set up s- smoke signals, and they're not that sophisticated, but it's still imparting information to you, much like the beeper, much like the telegraph. Or semaphore, which is, if you, semaphore, let me explain to people, semaphore is flag signaling. And it, what they use normally would be white flags, and you hold them up at different positions. And it's the way, semaphore was the way ships could signal to each other without having to get super close. So a guy, a guy would send, be on the edge of a ship and he'd be holding a flag and you could say, you know, positions like one hand would be at 3 o'clock, the other would be at 12 o'clock. And it, that would spell out the message to someone. This is pre-wireless, obviously. Uh, pre, in the 1800s, 1700s. And then they had flags that could signal pennants that they could run up that would set, signal a message like if they're under distress or if they're under attack and things like that. But obviously, if you can see a flag, right, you could tell if they're under attack. Or you could tell the the, the uh, semaphore signaling was also so foreign ships wouldn't sneak up running the flag of a friendly ship. You could have, anybody can have a British, uh, well, I don't know if they use British colors on their ships and they could sneak up on another British ship by just running those flags but there could be signals, secret signals you could send by putting a pennant at the top of the mast to make sure that it's still a friendly ship so it doesn't come up on you and start blasting away. How the fuck did I get to that point? So, yeah, I was talking about the guy coming in and say, hey, you're still doing a podcast and I really liked it and I go, whoa, well, I like it enough to follow it. I mean, were there people that liked Sopranos and say, well, I, I really like Sopranos. I wonder if it's still, uh, I'd like to see a new episode. I'm going, there's, you know, if you haven't seen it in a while, you, you weren't a big fan of Sopranos if you don't realize it's gone or Seinfeld or whatever, or Game of Thrones. Let's make it current. Game of Thrones. People say, oh, I'm meaning to watch Game of Thrones, I'm waiting for a new season. Well, no, it's all out. It's over. It's over, man. Just like Sopranos and Seinfeld. And now I'm not equating the quality of what I do to the quality of entertainment you get from Sopranos, Game of Thrones, or Seinfeld. But I'm still doing it. Another thing I wanted to address today was India. I originally... If you look at my statistics, the last couple months, about 
12% of my listeners are from India. Now, I don't know if that's just downloads where people are downloading and sharing in India and then putting it as their content onto, I think there's a podcast system called Giovanna, something like that in India. But I keep on showing places from like Kolkata, Pune, India, maybe Bangalore or Bangaroolu. And I just wonder if they're... I guess with 1.3 billion people, there could be, and there probably are people that, for some reason, find a value to listening to this show in India. I guess we, when I use the word foreign, I don't mean another nationality, so different. Our lifestyle here must seem so different to someone from India. I mean, basically, we have the same, probably the same thing about getting up, doing our own personal hygiene routines and working out, going to work, have the same goals, same inspirations, same work experiences. I mean, I'm sure you're, there may be some listeners saying, hey, listen, uh, I wonder what it's like in the Keys. Now, if you're from Miami, it's not really hard to understand what it's like down here. Or, you know, how, how we live, what, what's the routine here. Obviously in India, it, I mean, especially lots of parts of India, they're similar. I guess we have the similar weather. We have the similar, you know, similar climate. Especially if they're Oceanside, Indian Oceanside, some similar type reptiles and things like that, and it's you know the sea, sea life. But the just day to day, how we interact with people and what our concerns are versus what their concerns are in India has to be kind of revealing. Like here. Our, our main concern here could be like health care and our politics. In India, they have their politics too. Meaning, I think recently Modi was is their president or prime minister and he's kind of like a uh, somewhat, I'd have to say, I don't want to say conservative, but he's a Hindu nationalist, meaning that they have an idea uh, they have an idea of what the atypical India is. And that may be, I think according to Modi, it's primarily a Hindu India. Just like people here in certain conservative sections of politics or, or groups think that Christian is the typical makeup of the United States, traditional Christian makeup, and that's the basis for the United States. Both are right, and both are somewhat a little bit off the mark, because America, and much like India too, we're a heterogeneous society. I mean, you know that. I guess you know that in India, and I guess you are too, because the subcontinent, you you have... Where most of the people here are heterogeneous because they come from, they hail from different places. Hail means come from different places originally. Our ancestors did. The original ones, Native Americans, and then you have the Europeans showing up, and then the Europeans bringing over uh, an enslaved group of people, Africans over here against their will. And then there was the Latin American coming up, migrations. And then we have the migrations of immigrant groups that continue to this day. In India, which was settled for hundreds of thousands a year, because I guess they came, I don't, I don't if you have to believe in evolution and the origins of man, but those groups are from within and you have different groups 
that have just been around for tens of thousands of years. And they developed their own over you know, religion, their own cultures. And you have so many different languages in India. I mean, primarily being Hindi. And I guess your shared language is Hindi and English. But you have Urdu and uh, Pashtun and all these different languages in India. Tons of languages. I can't even uh, begin to fathom what's that like just to travel across. Now, we have that in the United States, but these people brought these languages with them from someplace else. In India, it developed from within the borders. A lot of those languages developed within the border. So why someone from India might find it fascinating, they may find it fascinating, they say, hey, this guy's kind of fucking nutty. His concerns aren't necessarily my concerns, or they align my concerns and his concerns are similar. That's more fascinating to me. If you go going to find out that, oh, here's someone from thousands of miles away and they have similar concerns to me and similar things that uh, they find interesting. And I guess... You know, if you're growing up in some resort or uh, living in some resort community in India, you might, and you work in the service industry, you might have a shared experience. So I ran, I mean, uh, in my life, I ran a lot of people of Indian ancestry and from India. So I, I can understand how someone would be interested in something else. I'm always interested when I hear about life in, in, in India, the Far East. I love seen those movies a foreign movie so I'm I'm just it's it's just so interesting how that and how that started with the India my uh, I don't know why that doesn't happen in China though there's 1.3 million Chinese and you figure they have to be they have the same probably maybe not the same literacy in English as the Indian as India does, but I imagine there's a lot of Chinese that do it, or it could be from state-run restrictions why there's not a significant listenership in India, I mean, in, in China. So I think someday, if it opens up, I may get like 8% or 12% of my listeners might be from China. Uh, and then eventually, I think a larger African, well, I don't know. In Africa, will that ever be a thing where you say, hey, listen, let's see what the old white man's having to say in the Florida Keys. Well, what's a fucking Florida Key? Is it a key that only fits in Florida? Or, the, you know, they may have a different word for keys over there and stuff like that. I know they have India or near India. But I think we'll leave that. I think I'm probably blathering right now with that. On to the tra- uh, traffic down here and the amount of business we have. It's good. It's really busy. But once again, I use the word anecdotally because I do not have a large cross-section. All I know is what I see and what I experience down here. And I notice a lot of businesses, there's not a surplus, let's say, workforce. There's not a surplus supply of workers for our workforce down here. And a lot of places seem to be kind of stretched Recently, I've known people that moved from jobs that were more less fo- less formal. They didn't work for small cor- uh, they work they didn't work for large corporations. But I've seen people that typically had worked for smaller employees go and move work for bigger employees. I knew someone that was working for an architect, and they had a really good job. It seemed like they had a really good job. It seemed like they were taken care of. It seemed like they had health care and stuff like that. But they ended up moving to uh, work for the hospital, uh, the big hospital system down here. And uh, I guess that's, you know, there's a lot of security. There's a lot of mobility upwards when you're working for a bigger corporation. You know, in a small corporation, if you think about it, you, you hit the ceiling real quick. You're either in line to be, you know, take over the business in a, in a very small business or you just move to be, I mean, your highest is to be a senior employee, a confidant of the owner. That's pretty much it. 
And that's a nice thing. You know, a lot, usually you don't get that in big corporations. But in big corporations, you have the hope of moving up. Sky's the limit. You could end up being a CEO. Every so often, there's a company, say, this guy at McDonald's used to be a fry cook in Anaheim, California. And now he's a CEO. Well, yeah, he was. This, he happened to have been a fry cook. And he ended up, his parents, he ended up going to uh, you know, a Brown University and a Harvard Business School and then ended up CEO uh, 25, 30 years later. It's not, it, it's like hitting a lottery. People think they can go up, but there is room. There, there is room. Like you could work in Amazon, you work at UPS, you can end up being a supervisor going up, boom, boom, boom. And then eventually you have a ceiling. People, sometimes people get kind of, you know what I mean? They they can't ground down by the gr- the grind of a big corporation with their rules and the, and the nuances of new regulation and 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 rules from in, within the company and from without and the insecurities of you know business, meaning you can go up and down. Prior to COVID. Retail wasn't necessarily a bad thing to be in, but it was on the way out. COVID put a stake in the heart of brick-and-mortar retail. Online retail exploded. Um, Jeff Bezos, and I'm going to repeat it. Now, this is just a repeated one. He lost $38 billion in his divorce settlement over a year ago to his wife. Well, since COVID, he almost recouped 80% of everything he lost in the divorce settlement. And so it was 30, let's say it was $38 billion. I'm just going to do a roundabout number. I think it is. And he may recoup $35 billion. Holy shit. Just think of that. One thousandth, one thousandth of that his gain during COVID would make you a very wealthy person in every country you could think of. 1,000. He has enough money for that gain is enough to put, let's say, 10,000 people to retire very, very comfortably. 10,000 people. If he just decided to say, listen, I'm going to gift this to 10,000 people. And the, the, those people, progeny, pretty much set a life. It would change their lives. Or, or maybe it wouldn't. Who knows? I, I, don't, I have this feeling that necessarily found money isn't necessarily the most productive money. It's usually the money you earn yourself. Here I am. I'm a progressive, but I got these capitalistic instincts, right? People always get pissed off at me about that stuff. But down here, we're pushed, when I say anecdotally, I think it appears as if businesses are pushed to the breaking point. We have tons of business. We have tons of business. We have tons of visitors. We couldn't ask for better, really, considering what the past year has been. And we're, we're, I'm, I'm making money, but I, I see places that there's, there's tough jobs here. Back of the house is very tough. And usually when you're working back in a house, the part of your work, the less return you see for it. Because obviously they need a certain amount of people to run the back of the house. But when you're pushed to the brink of capacity, you don't see a commensurate increase in your earnings. And that's the problem. If you saw a commensurate Increase your money. You say, I'm working my ass off here. I'm working harder. I'm working later. But just because you're working an extra two hours or an hour a night, you see a one-eighth or one-tenth increase become just the amount of time you're spending. Is that adequate compensation considering you're working twice as hard? And 
it's hard to measure stress. What's the cost of stress and uh, the cost of stress? And so in, in the Keys, you've heard mentioned before that we geographically, we're isolated, but we're also tied to the mainland. We have a highway all the way down here, but we're separated by about 35 miles from major po- population center. And that's considerable considering that there's no, there is public transportation that comes down there. It's spotty at best sometimes. If you had a big public transportation company in, in like a, you know, the, the, the public, quasi public private uh, transportation companies in the big regional cities in the United States, usually when they see an uptick in capacity, they just add buses. Well, down here, I always wanted to find out what the bus line that supplies the keys, the upper keys, with uh, that drives from Florida City up down up flies, drives down here. Who owns it? Is it a, I think it's a private company, but it is kind of contracted. There's some aid that comes in from Monroe County and Maybe Dade County. I'm not sure. I guess I should do a whole show on that sometime. But you have to think of the psychology. If you got to wait for a bus, let's say you have to wait for a bus 25, 30 minutes. That's on a good day, right? And then you got to ride down. It's going to be 45 minutes. So you're walking around 40, 40, 45 minutes. That's without traffic. So that's an hour every day. Well, no, actually, let's say two hours every day because it's coming and going. At the end, if you work late at night, sometimes if the bus is full, it'll just drive by. They will not send an extra bus. I'm almost certain about that. They don't, they don't, they have a certain amount of buses. And if there's capacity, it takes a long lag time for them to add to capacity, to go and adjust to capacity. But considering business, we're not just, I, we, we don't know, we don't see an influx of workers down here. Now, there's several factors that really could affect that. It could be the f- four and a half years of very hard immigration restrictions. I'm not worried about getting in trouble for this, but having a little lax immigration helps certain industries. It helps agriculture. It helps service. It helps construction. If you look at the statistics of where immigrants and undocumented immigrants work, it says in those industries. I mean, you can get a work visa for agriculture, but it's harder to get it for those other things. Construction, in service, for some reason, people think that they're going to hire Americans. And that, in, unless it's like a union job for a carpentry where you're getting paid 26 to $30 an hour, they're not, they're paying the, these construction crews. These guys are making 10 to, 10 to 12 bucks an hour. And they're paid, a lot of times, they're paid under a table. So the contractor gets money, and they have, I mean, I guess, I don't know how they, would show on a tax form how they spent that money on labor. They can just hide it in supplies. I don't. I, I don't want to get involved in that. But down here, there's no. There's no extra help. People aren't traveling, and it could be that thing that people said with the stimulus and the extended unemployment. Some people are choosing not to work. I never get that people don't value the work. Like if you can make, if I can make the same amount of money working as I made in unemployment, I still work. If I can make the same in unemployment, I guess so. I do it because there's a value in work. There's a value in doing something and coming home and getting paid. Now, unfortunately, I, I may be hypocritical to say, hey, Jim, you're a bartender, so you'd never get what you would get in unemployment. But I said, it's just not, even if I worked in another job, I still wouldn't want to just receive payments 
for not working. Because at the end of the day, there's, I may, you may bitch about your job, but once you're done working, it, it's, it's, for me, it's, it's kind of like a, a recharging period. It's like exercising the batteries. But without these people down here, like there's multiple reasons, whether people aren't willing to work, aren't willing to do the work, there may not be people to do the work, right? There may not be people to do the work, or there could be just a dwindling amount of space down here where people we used to put up with, uh, put up with. We'd have people that travel down here from the mainland, and you have a certain amount of people that would live down here. Because there's a calculus that goes on when you're living down here, especially in the Upper Keys. In Key West, you don't have that choice. In Key West, you have to work. You have to live down there because there's no way you're going to. I mean, unless you're flying in on your own plane and you say, "Hey, listen, I'm flying to Key West Airport. I got my little Piper Cub, and I just land and then go to work." You know, it takes an hour and ten minutes every day. I fly in from. Homestead. I don't. If there's someone doing that, great. But a line uh, share of people, Marathon and South on South live here, and a lot of real estate is disappearing right now. That used to be for workforce housing. So, without that workforce housing. We have to rely on, especially the upper keys, on people coming down from Florida City. And these work for housing, they were sub-optimum properties, and they're disappearing. Because I just, I just did a signing the other day, and I was going to a street that used to have a bunch of places that had uh, trailers that were converted to dwellings. Like, there could be large camper trailers or m- modular homes, but... They were subpar optimum housing. And I was going there to do a signing. And in the back of my head, I was thinking, well, um, this didn't sound like the kind of person that lived in that kind of house. And I was being judgmental, I think. But I show up, a new construction. It's a 2-1. It looks like a 2-1 and a half. Beautiful new place. I know they probably spent about $400,000 on this house. The house that it replaced wasn't worth Christ. If it was up on the mainland, something like that, it wouldn't have been worth like $60,000. But they used to probably collect about $2,500 a month in rent because they had about five people living in it. But you know what happened? Someone takes a property to get a zoning permit, they build on it, and they put a house for $400,000, which isn't... Let's say this, and I'm going to say this, and I'm in the, I'm involved part time with real that the property down here you have to read the property down here because you're not going to get for four hundred thousand you're not going to get the house that you get for four hundred thousand in Ocala four hundred thousand you're going to get like a four three with a pool and all that stuff and a nice chunk of land four hundred thousand here. You get like a ton, and it's going to be the size of a condo. With you know, driveway. Uh, if you're lucky, uh, enough parking in front of your house for two, and a little yard to put your dog in in the back, and do some barbecuing, and that's it. That's the keys because we're limited space. So when those four hundred, when you put up a four hundred thousand house that could sell for four hundred thousand, I'm not saying it's necessarily worth four hundred thousand, but that's a value. It's just like value of a professional football player. Ten million dollars a year. Is the guy worth ten million dollars a year? It's a math thing. You decide in your head. That's what a career's worth, right? Art. What is it worth? It's a perception. Is that house really worth it? Take it out of the keys. It could be a hundred fifty thousand dollar house. Right? No, put it in the keys, four hundred thousand. Now they do the construction maybe with the impact windows, maybe it's thousand dollars. Okay. We'll just you know, that's why I was thinking you put a shoe box with a uh, a bucket and a hose, you have you know, you have a residence down here. That's what it used to be. Now the hat residents are being replaced and there's multiple reasons first of all covid a lot of people want to move out of places they see florida as a place to say you know 
It has very little restrictions. So what are you going to do? Um, you put up uh, a piece of property that's worth four hundred thousand. You're going to rent it to someone. How much do you have to rent it for to get twenty five hundred dollars a month? Who's going to pay twenty five hundred dollars a month for two one? Some people might. You know, it depends on what you're making. That's the math thing. And that's why it may be hard to get people to work and you, you're having harder and harder to, times to find people to work <coughs> down here. Are willing to do a certain job. Well, that's pretty much it today. I'll be back tomorrow. I'd like to thank everyone for listening, especially India. I'd like to thank Shelbyana, Kentucky. Shelby Anna, Shelby Anna. I, I like that name. Shelby Anna, Kentucky. Is it Shelby Anna, Kentucky? Bayville, New Jersey. i got to name some of those places. Alcorn, Nebraska. Thank you for listening. I'm going to uh, try to remember to mention those. If you like the show, please share it with your friends. Uh, send me a message at jimandkeysbartender.com. I'll answer any of your questions if you want to be read on um, just send me a note if you want the question to be read on the podcast or not. If you want to be identified, you can just say, hey, this is anonymous. I promise I'll do it. This is a promise between you and I. Uh, thank you for listening. And if you are in the Florida Keys, before I sign off, in the Upper Keys, Mile Marker 102, the Catch and Bar, Oceanside, open for lunch and dinner, happy hour, 3.30 to 6.30 that's Monday through Friday with great deals on food and drinks. Uh, the Catch Restaurant is a great place for seafood and non-seafood dishes. If you catch your own seafood and it's filleted and all that, bring it in and they'll catch it. I mean, they'll catch it. They'll cook it almost any style you want. It's a great place to hang out. That's the Catch Restaurant and Bar in Key Largo at Mile Marker 102 Oceanside. And if you come in, please tell the host that the Keys bartender sent you. Thank you very much and have a great day. Let's play some of this music here.